Welcome to this episode in our series on the use, misuse and abuse of jihad in Islam. Uh, it could be the metaphor of a journey where often you... Are. Of course there are verses that relate to rulings of warfare in Islam. Discuss the rulings of warfare in Islam. Assalamu alaikum and peace be with you. Welcome to this episode in our series on the use, misuse and abuse of jihad in Islam where we will be looking at the Islamic textual and historical analysis of contentions and misconceptions, misinterpretations of texts related to the concept of jihad, the Islamic law of war and peace, and issues related to the spread of Islam. I am your host, Muhammad Nuruddin Lemo, and with me to discuss today's topics are our two Bellos, uh, Brother Nasir Bello and Brother Ibrahim Bello, distinguished facilitators with the Dawah Institute. You're both most, wel most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, Alam Ibrahim, in a previous episode, we discussed one of the verses in Surah Al-Anfal, um, Surah number 8, verse 15, where it was talking about desertion, as we explained before. But some also look at it as the prohibition of turning back or turning away from battle has been interpreted by some in another way to imply you don't turn back from a fight until you are victorious. You cannot surrender. You can't say we are being defeated, we are losing more and more casualties, so let's surrender. Um, and definitely that their understanding is this verse prohibits Muslims from having treaties. What exactly is the understanding? What exactly is this verse talking about? Does it in any way justify these type of assertions or claims? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And like you say, some actually have misunderstood the verse to mean no retreat, no surrender, no treaty, no mercy. Just go fight till you die. It's either you die fighting or you win, mm. but no two way about it. But it's very funny, it is not true. Because historically, Muslims had treaties. In some places, they surrendered or they accept others surrendering and offer them peace. Okay? And they showed mercy. So, no treaty, no retreat, no surrender is not true. Because, as we're going to see detail later, all of these Muslims had treaties. Amidst the heat of battle, mm. Quran says you can accept their offer for peace. Mm. And in fact, if they incline towards peace, even when you are still victorious, you are still mm. powerful, Allah say, hands down. Oh, yeah. So, it's, it doesn't make sense. Maybe because like others do, they quote out of context. And so what we will be doing is to look at a more broader context of the verses surrounding. Yeah. It's like taking it from the beginning of the paragraph now. Allah say, what is you hear a book? Let's go back to, let's say, verse 14, since that is verse 15 and 16 or so. Allah say, is you hear a book? Okay, so remember when your Lord revealed to the angels that I am with you, so. Support, strengthen the believers. I will strike terror into the minds or hearts of the disbelievers. Therefore, smite on their necks and sleep, smite on their fingers. Mean, fight them. Allah say, "Zalika bi anhum shaqq Allah wa Rasoola. Wa ma yushaqq Allah wa Rasoola hu fa inna Allah shadid al iqab." This is because they defy and disobey Allah and His Messenger. Whosoever defy and disbelieve in Allah and his messenger, verily Allah's punishment is very dire. Allah say, then, Ya ayuhal lazina amanu, iza laqaytumul lazina kafaru zahafan fala tuwalluhumul adbar. O you those who have attained faith, if you see enemies advancing, you meet them already at the battlefront. Allah say, you don't turn back. Whomsoever, or whosoever in this instance, will desert or retreat, 
when you're already facing the enemy. Basically, it's telling you you're already at the forefront of it. Except if it were to be a strategy of war, you retreat to go and re-strategize. Mm -hmm. Or you retreat to a troop of believers. Aside these two, Allah say at that point you don't do it. Else you'll be incurring the wrath of Allah. And the verse continue. He said, فَلَمْ تَقَتُلُوهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ قَتَلَهُ It was not you who killed them when you killed. It was by Allah's will. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ is رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It wasn't even you who cast when you throw your arrows and, you know, and mm. weapons. It's by Allah's will. So you have all of these verses describing the realities. Okay, it's just about, okay. He's telling you the conduct of warfare. And it was particular to some people. And we could also see in the verse that Allah told you who you fight and why you should fight. Now, let's look at these verses a little more clearly. The verse made it clear that, aside from being the fact, the fact that it's describing the context of warfare, Allah is just telling you, Angels, Allah inspired in the angels to support the believers, to strengthen them. It could be physical, it could be Allahu Alam. Spiritual inspiration. Spiritual inspiration, of course. And Allah is telling you when you fight, do this, do this. Of course, one will say, but why will Allah go to that extent? Number one, <laughs> these were people that a good number of them were normal, some of them were not warriors. Again, the cases of these verses were recounting the instances of Battle of Badr, which was the first major encounter, actually the real physical encounter Muslim had with the non-Muslims. Also, they did not prepare for a fight. So for Allah to have this kind of inspiration and ways of encouragement, telling them exactly what to do, just tell you, okay, it's just about how to. So, it is wrong for one to assume that these verses are all about continue fighting, don't accept peace offer. No. It's out of context. Because the context describes they are already fighting. And like we say, all historians, nobody had difference that these verses were relating to the cases of Badr. And with the Quraysh, when there was existing hostility, because when we look at history also, we see that Muslims had treaties, as we're going to see later. Muslims had uh, Muslim surrender. In fact, some verses of Quran shows that if enemies outnumber you to some extent, then you can, you can, you can back out. Mm -hmm. And practical examples during the life of the Prophet and Umar and all of that. And in fact, even from the verse, Allah said, إِلَّا مُتَحَرِّفًا لِقِتَالٍ أَوْ مُتَحَيِّزًا إِلَى فِئَةٍ أَوْ مُفَصِرُونَ سَيْ فِئَةٍ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ You retreat to another group of believers because you feel, no, you cannot do it. The Prophet Sallallahu retreated to the, to, to the valleys of Uhud and a number of other instances like that were yeah. So, practically what we're just saying is this verse shouldn't be read alone. You read the surrounding verses. And you look at the historical reality of why it was revealed. And then, how did Muslims do? So basically, there is nothing like no retreat, no surrender. That, that is inconceivable in reality. Yeah. Oh, Nasser, your comments. Well, I think uh, if you look at uh, not just Muslims, but even in the military, usually when people deserted the group and ran away, uh, there are punishment for that, for the army. So it's something that uh, the context, I, 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 if you look at the verse clearly, it's speaking about that kind of desertion, not actually um, not retreating. Mm. And that was why, had it been, it says, uh, and kept quiet without these exceptions then you now uh, are you are now at liberty to come up with these conclusions but these exceptions about uh, you can do that when you are trying to re-strategize or you are trying to retreat back to you know again another form of re-strategizing uh, since the battle is going on 
I think this is the context, even looking at the bar, the text itself. Um, so I don't see it in any way connecting to the idea of retreating when you are overpowered uh, or outnumbered. And that is why if you look at the statement that was actually quoted by Ibn Ashur, where he talked about the case during the Battle of Qadisiyah, when it was reported that Abu Ubaid uh, and other groups of Muslims, Abu Ubaid ibn Mas'ud uh, al thaqafi and other group of Muslims were actually killed and defeated. Umar said, I wish, sort of, why didn't they retreat back? Why didn't they retreat back? Because um, there is a level that when it appears to be suicidal, then you have to reconsider. Uh, and that also, I mean, look at one of the great commanders in the, Muslim, in the Islamic history, Khalid ibn Walid. Yes. It was reported that he retreated during the, uh, the Battle of Mu'tah. Mm. Uh, and even Rasulullah is as rightly mentioned by Brother Ibrahim Dello, retreated during the Battle of Uhud. And that was why in, in, in the book Ar-Hiq al uh, it was actually mentioned that when Muslims are outnumbered or overpowered, it is permissible for them re to retreat to go back and strategize, to seek for, you know, agreement, uh, to surrender if it becomes necessary. Uh, and if you read through the history of, you know, Muslim civilization, you will find a lot of instances in our history where this kind of, you know, retreats happen. And nobody faulted that in our history, be it the Spanish Inquisition, uh, be it the Crusade, um, uh, or maybe even colonization, or the conquest of you know yeah. Muslims in Baghdad mm -hmm. by the Mughals, so these are all examples that and, and th these are all examples that you would find in our history that are actually related to this idea of when you are overpowered, when you are conquered, you should retreat. And so, 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 if you look at the Sunnah of uh, of, of of Islam or the Sunnah of you know Rasulullah Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, it gives us a lot of reasons that when the situation warrants, you can retreat, you can even surrender, depending on what actually uh, the situation dictates, as we've seen lots of examples. And if you still go back to the Quran, because the general idea is the fact that this you know, verse is telling Muslims to not turn back to fight to the end, to fight to the last. It's either win or you die. And you know, the proponent of this kind of ideas, they will keep telling you, this very popular slogan of Imma Nasr Awi Shahada. You just have to either win or you die. Uh, yeah, or martyrdom. But, I mean, this is not what the history tells us. This is not what we see uh, with the life of Rasul and the companions. And just like we are looking at it from the angle of the Muslims, in the event that, okay, it is the enemy that surrender, the fact that the interpretation is you keep fighting to the end, does that mean you now you are not going to discard all these verses that talks about I mean, if they seek, yeah, yeah if they seek for asylum, yes. uh, they've surrendered that you should now give them that asylum. Somebody that you are given asylum, you are taking him under your protection. Basically, what you are saying is it's over. The battle is over because the hostility has ceased to exist. exist. Or oh, in general, if they seek for you know peace, you should open up to that. Or even وَقَاتِلُوا مَا تَلَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونُ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ فَإِنْ إِنْتَهُوا فَلَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا أَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ لَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا أَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ That if they, I mean, I mean, if, 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 if they cease fire, then you don't have any reason because the whole idea of your fight is toward the oppressors. So lots of examples in the Quran and Sunnah telling us that this idea of, you know, withdrawing is a two-way thing. You can because you are the ones in charge. I mean, if you look at the other verse where Allah talked about إِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَتَبَيَّنُوا وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامَ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنَا تَبْتَغُونَ أَرْضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That even there, those that say, okay, we are now submitting, we are now calling for peace. You shouldn't say, no, you are not trustworthy. Mm, no I mean, you should, you should withdraw. So these are all examples that are telling us this idea of you continue fighting to the end is completely uh, not in sync, it's, not, it's alien to our, the understanding, the proper understanding uh, of the religion and the teachings of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, 
uh, in his companions. It reminds one of the legal maxim, al umur bi maqasidiha, that matters are judged based on their purposes. And as you are saying, once it's clear that the purpose of war has been defeated and it's not going to be victory, um, then you don't continue with something where you know the final end is not what you are looking for. Um, and as you've both made it clear, we had treaties at the time of the Prophet and the companions in spite of this verse. We had retreats at the time of the Prophet and the companions in spite of this verse. Um, so this verse has never been understood to mean no retreats um, if you know you have to or no peace treaties if you have to um, and no you know no taking of prisoners uh, this was not the understanding of the early generation the next text that is usually quoted comes from a hadith in both Bukhari and Muslim where um, it talks about fighting that the kalima of Allah would be supreme. Um, some have interpreted this verse in a very political sense, yeah, some do, you know, uh, which is that this verse is saying you should fight for the establishment of an Islamic political state and that this verse is justification for fighting to establish a state. What are your thoughts on this verse? What do scholars say about it? What exactly does it mean that you fight for Allah's word or Allah's promise to be supreme? Well, I think uh, it's still an issue of interpretation. Um, if you look at the hadith, it's hadith, it's hadith actually that was narrated by uh, one of the great companions, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, where he narrated that somebody, a Bedouin, came to Rasulullah and asked about somebody who fight for pride, somebody who fight, fight for recognition, somebody who fight just for people to say, this guy is just amazing, he is outstanding, he is this, he is that. And could that be for the sake of Allah? Fi sabirillah. He said, Man qatala li taquna kalimatillahi yal uliya wa fi sabirillah. So the hadith says, "Ani rajul so ila Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ani rajul yuqatil shujaa, ani yuqatil riya, ani yuqatil hamiyat. Ayu dalik yikun fi sabirillah. Fakala man qatil li taqun kalimat Allah hi al uliya, fahu fi sabirillah." Now, man qatil whoever fought. So, for, for, so just a minute. So what you are saying is a translation. Whoever fights for these purposes, tribalism. Uh, bravery, etc., etc. The man is asking, "Is this fi sabilillah? Could this be fi Could these any yeah. of these be fi yeah. And the response the prophet is giving is, "Fi sabilillah is actually fighting for Allah's word to be supreme." Exactly. Yal-uliya. So you can as well interpret it to mean, "Man qatala fi sabilillah." That fighting fi sabilillah is, you know, litakuna kalimatillah yaluli. I mean, the opposite, because it can be seen from either angle. And when you do it that way, then you will better understand what uh, you will come up with an interpretation that is in sync with what is known around the idea of initiating, you know, engaging in, in, in fight. Because if you fight fi sabilillah, then that is litakuna kalimatillahi al uh, uh, So that is basically what that is. Now, the interpretation that is problematic or that appear to be problematic is that which, as you mentioned, suggests that man qatala li takuna kalimati lai yal wuliya gave you a goal that you are fighting for political supremacy to, you know, achieve a political state. That this is the ultimate goal you are looking at. Li takuna kalimati lai yal wuliya. And that is the only thing that makes it feasibilina. Any other reason is something different. It's not feasibilina. So, but so the issue is uh, still going back to our argument that for you to understand and appreciate the you know meaning of this kind of controversial you know uh, interpretations uh, or cont- or text, you have to go back to the forest, not just the tree. You have to look at the text and its own context. What actually? Uh, what other 
prophetic traditions around this subject? What other verses of Quran around this subject are saying? Are they in line with the interpretation, with this interpretation, or they are in line with another interpretation? This is the basis within which you, you know, you, you look at which one is more appropriate. And even in the science of hadith, sometimes you would find hadith that appear to be authentic, but the fact that it is contradicting other, you know, a hadith that are more authentic or they are coming from more reliable people, then it will now be thrown away. That is the idea of Shahs and Mahfuz. And that also goes into the idea of interpretation. If your interpretation of a text that appear to have multiple meaning contradicts the understanding of other relevant, you know, texts in Clearer that particular text. subject yeah. that are very clear and the views of, you know, the majority, uh, understanding of the majority in that subject, definitely yours will not hold water. And moreover, if you look at this interpretation, it has also contradicted the practice of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, regarding if you look at the gazawad that we analyzed and the reasons behind each and every one of them. I mean, you will wonder what brings even the idea of, you know, an Islamic state as the ultimate objective. You cannot find any where, where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say, okay, we are now going out for this particular battle with the sole reason that we want to conquer lands and build, you know, a Muslim empire. That has never happened. That has never happened. Every battle was defensive. Exactly. Every battle was defensive and there is this justification. It's either trying to handle, you know, issues of oppression or trying to protect themselves against an aggression. You know, we've looked at a lot of examples like that. And therefore, looking at all this, naturally it will tell you that the interpretation that brings out an ultimate objective that is different from all that other texts, all other texts are, are saying is really problematic. Now coming back to this issue of, you know, the idea of having an Islamic state or Islamic compliant state uh, or Sharia compliant state or, you know, government system that uh, uh, uses, you know, the principles and the guidelines of Islam. I don't think that idea uh, is the problem. I think the problem is fighting and killing for that ultimate goal because that is unprecedented. And Again, this question of superiority, what do you find in our tradition when it comes to, you know, different forms of jihad, or what do you even fight or struggle for, is what is the context asking? Because this issue of Masali and Ibad is the ultimate objective of Islam, of Sharia. That is why you find sometimes somebody will come and wanting to join jihad. Rasulullah will say, where are your parents? Go and do jihad on them by obeying them. Sometimes Rasulullah will say, Abdalul Jihad, saying the truth behind, you know, a ruler. Kalmatu in the you know, you know, yeah. So this kind of thing. So that is why scholars would always discuss and say, okay, that by implication is saying um, jihad as a general form, as a general concept. Uh, what is best is really dictated by concept, I mean, by context of the individual, of the society, what is the need in the society and the intention of the person that is actually uh, involved. And that by implication, what is telling us is uh, context will define the best form of jihad. And again, by implication, what it's saying is for Muslims to open up their mind and look at this concept in a much broader perspective, that all kind of services you render, that you have the capacity or your area of expertise, all you need is to align them towards the objective of, you know, the religion of Sharia and you refine your intention. If you tilt your intention as a contribution you are going to give to solve a problem to the Ummah, just like we've seen in many ahadiths of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that will mean you are now giving your own contribution, you are doing your own form of jihad. And like uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya uh, once said, he said this idea of jihad I mean, the idea of what becomes uh, the priority of the ummah is dictated amongst the forms of jihad, among the forms of, you know, uh, striving and struggling for the, the, the benefit of the ummah, for, for, for supporting and building the ummah. He said it's dictated by the needs of the society. Sometimes it could be that the intellectual jihad is the priority, not the, you know, military one. Sometimes it could be the financial jihad of supporting and providing funding 
is the priority because there are different forms of jihad as we discussed uh, in previous episodes. Anu Ibrahim, what would you add? Yeah, just to add to what he has said, we don't have in history of the Sahaba and the Prophet where they forced Islam, they fought people to form a state. Historically, all of us know how Medina was formed. It was basically looking for like a safe haven for Muslims to go practice their Islam. So they didn't fight those people to establish the states. Similarly, we look at Sahabas also and their life. Basically, the Islamic states or city-state of Medina came to be what it was, was because of the Prophet's character an exemplary life and that of his Sahabas and through da'awa and enlightenment and over time it evolved to be what it was and even then you had non-Muslims that lived therein. So I think the Hadith clearly is just telling us what, are, what should be the motivation for fighting and what should not be. It's all about sincerity of purpose, the intent, the purpose behind fighting. And you know, the, the hadith that Lita Kuna Kalimatullah here, basically you just meant for Islam to prevail, mm. for the truth and the cause of justice to prevail. I remember Imam Noah, in one of his commentary on the hadith said, this could include also those who are fighting for the cause of justice to liberate the oppressed. It could also be for the sake of God. Mm. Because like uh, Mal Nasir said, he said, Man qatala lita kuna kalimatullahi al-uliya fa huwa fi sabilillah. The man asked, ayu dhalika fi sabilillah. So it means, for you to fight, fi sabilillah is the meaning of li ilai kalimatillahi na. To raise the flag of Islam, simple. To raise the flag of the way of God. So this is as simple as that. It's about sincerity and as we're going to see from other commentaries, it's just about be obedience to Allah and His Prophet. Obey the injunctions laid down by Allah and the Prophet. It's about sincerity. There's nothing about forcing or making Islamic State. And when we look in later, we see the exact words that they are taking and justifying that is about Islamic State. That what Kalimatullah yeah. That is not what it is meant to serve. And I think, you know, as you've both uh, mentioned, what the hadith is juxtaposing. Somebody is asking, you know, is pride, fighting for pride, fighting for valor, fighting for, you know, tribalism. Um, which of these are fi sabilillah? And the Prophet is saying it's none of them. No, no, And, sure. you know, why? Because these are all selfish uh, motives. These are all un-Islamic. This is not fi sabilillah. This yeah. is fi sabilillah shaitan. This is, this, yeah. is, um, this is not Allah's way. Um, it is to raise the word of Allah uh, that is fi sabilillah. And I think the points you've both also touched on, that we don't see in the lives of the Sahaba, they are understanding this hadith to mean we're going to go out and fight to establish a state. Um, when these Sahaba went after the death of the Prophet uh, to various parts of the Muslim world, it was for da'wah. It was for peace treaties. It was to enlighten people. And these societies gradually got influenced and gradually evolved into Muslim societies. Some of these societies never even saw a single Muslim soldier. If we look at uh, areas from Malaysia to Indonesia and uh, many other parts of the world uh, where Islam spread. And I think one key point is this hadith in no way justifies the clear things that are haram because we have other verses of the Quran that tell us wajahidu fi sabilillahi and fight in the cause of Allah wa qatidu fi sabilillahi and dina yuqahidunakum wa la ta'atadu and fight fi sabilillah those who fight you and do not transgress so it's using the same word fi sabilillah um, you know other verses that talk about fighting fi sabilillah for the weak among women, men, uh, children, mm. etc. So mm. this issue of uh, the meaning of fi sabilillah is being juxtaposed in this hadith with pride, arrogance, or you know, uh, valor, tribalism, 
but it's never a justification for terrorism or killing innocent people. Uh, mm. I'd like us to look at this hadith uh, from the point of view of scholars. You've touched on Imam Nawawi's yeah. comment. What more can you tell us about the views of um, jurists and scholars uh, regarding the meaning and implication of this hadith? How did they understand it? Okay, okay, let's start again. Like Imam Nawawi, the, all of them, most scholars that commented on the hadith, say it is all about intention, purity of intention, sincerity of purpose. Okay, so like in the sense that one is intended for pride, another one is tribal, yes. another one is self-promotion, yes. bravery. Yeah. The fi sabilillah is the intention should be. Yeah, for the sake of God. Mm. And that's why like scholars used to start their books with sincerity of purpose, purity of intention. In Riyadh Salihin, Imam Nawawi we brought it under the chapter of sincerity mm -hmm. and purity of intention, same hadith. Similarly, Imam Nawawi in Al Minhaj, his commentary on Sahih Muslim, he said such fighting, you know, could include even those that are fighting for just cause. That can be feasibility also. He said, although the hadith is apparently about fighting disbelievers, it could cover those who set out to fight tyrants, armed robbers, and to ensure establishment of good and avoidance of evil. Any fighting for just cause, he said, can be part of this. Similarly, Badruddin al Aini, one of the great commentators of Sahih al Bukhari, also said that the hadith is all about importance of sincerity should be your motivation and to do things for the sake of God. Sheikh Usaymin also said the same thing. So I think hadith, the hadith, basically what it is teaching is, like other verses of Quran explain, is for us to be law abiding. Law abiding in the sense that go according to the guidelines of Sharia, even when fighting. So meaning the cause of the fighting and even the conduct of the fighting should be according to how Allah and his prophet have taught us. And that's why you have this verse in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 45. Allah says, Ya yuallazina amanu iza laqitum fi'atan fasbutu. Wazkurullaha kathiran la'allakum tufliku. If you meet an enemy, be firm. Okay? And remember Allah a lot, so that you might be successful. He says, Wa ati'u allaha wa rasoolahu. Wa la tanaza'u fa tafshalu wa tazhabarihu kum wasbu. And... Obey Allah and his prophet and do not dispute so that you don't, you know, you don't uh, disorganize. You don't, you don't disunite. Mm. If not, your strength will weaken. So you see, the, the, the verse is giving Muslims guidelines. So when the prophet says, Man qatala litakuna kalimatullahi al-uliya fa huwa fi sabilillah, it's about intention, sincerity of purpose, why you are fighting. But he's also telling you that you must do it to please God. Mm. And to please God, it has to be according to how it is taught by Allah and his prophet. So the hadith is in no way a justification or motivation for people to fight for any Islamic state. It's not about Islamic state per se. Because the word kalimatullah here, as we are going to look at, it's not for just having Islamic state. It's mm. just about for Islam mm. to prevail. And you know that is why in the verse I quoted earlier, Allah immediately just opposed by telling Muslims. He said, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ ذِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرِعَا النَّاسِ وَيَسُدُّونَ أَمْسَلِهِ لِلَّهِ You don't go to fight and behave like your enemies, the kuffar. Mm. They went out boastfully and out of pride. Allah said those ones are boasting and it's for pride. Yo, it's for the sake of God. So people should get it clearly that this hadith like other verses of Quran are just about your intention matters, your purpose matters, conduct yourself according to what will please Allah. Your motivation should just be the pleasure of Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah. And that's all. Allah Nasser, you know, what more can you say on this uh, equating litakuna kalimatullah hi al with fi sabilillah? You know, that, you know, it basically that Allah's word would be supreme 
um, is not saying anything new that we have not heard in the verses of the Quran or Hadith. Um, what what light could you shed? Well, I think, like you rightly mentioned, it doesn't present anything new uh, with what the Quran or other Hadith of Prophet are saying. Um, on several occasions, you would find the Quran, uh, and of course, different contexts, you would find the Quran using a lot of ways to motivate uh, Muslims to strive. Uh, just like if you look at uh, some of the verses we earlier treated where uh, the Quran says مَالَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضَعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِي الْقَرِيَةِ ظَالِمِ أَهْلُهَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ نَصِيرًا Here the motivation is this issue of you know, you know rescuing the weak but في سبيل الله so trying to remind us of our values as Muslims, of trying to ensure justice and do it for the sake of Allah. Or the other verse that followed, which talked about, you know, grouping Muslims, This is also telling us that this is what we represent. This is what the camp that we represent. When we do it with Sabilillah. And if you go to another verse where Allah talked about, Qatilu fi sabilillah illadina yuqatilu lakum. This is on another verse that is motivating Muslims. So if you put all these verses and ahadis together, just like man qatala li takuna kalimatillahi al uliya, what you can conclude by is if people fight for pride, for, you know, the, you know, for these isms, it could be tribalism, it could be, uh, uh, racism for all these kind of things uh, for for them to show of themselves these are representing you know being the friends of the good because they are fighting not fi sabilillah but fighting fi sabilillah anything that is you know fi sabilillah that is about representing the values of islam is then regarded as being fi sabilillah as the other category or the other opposite what you're saying here is fi sabilillah is simply in God's cause for a goodly purpose. And depending on the context, it may be helping the oppressed, it may be doing anything along the lines of Allah's guidance in the Quran uh, and, and through the Sunnah. Um, we find the phrase, Fi Sabilillah, appearing in a number of verses and hadith. Um, that phrase, litakuna kalimatullah here al uliya, this idea of that kalimatullah, the word of Allah, will be supreme. Um, how is this used? Is this the only hadith where it appears, or is it also used in other contexts? You know, the word kalimatullah for many um, just means the word of Allah, the Quran. Um, I just want to know this, this phrase, is it something new in this hadith, or does, you know, are the words also used in? This phrase also used in other texts. Well, I think one other place you find uh, this statement, this phrase, Kalimatullahi al Uliya mentioned, is a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was actually telling us uh, the incident that happened during the migration of Rasul from Mecca to Medina when he talked about Idhuma uh, fil Ghar. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِسَاهِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا فَأَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَى رَسُولِهِ وَعَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَأَيَّدَهُمْ 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 بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السُّفُلَى وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا That when Rasulullah was migrating together with his friend, that is Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he said they, 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 they hide at some point in a cave and when they were there he said is is yaqulu li sahibi he said to his friend that is abu bakr no siddiq la tazan don't be afraid don't be scared god is with us then it later talked about allah strengthened them and supported them with the support of his angels and he made that is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the you know the kalima the the, the kalima that you I mean, in this context, if you say, okay, kalimatul ladina kafaru suhula, meaning their mission, what they are after, what they represent. Their cause. Just, yeah, their cause. 
and he said waja'ala kalimatullah hiya al-uliya as an opposite and he made the cause you know what muslims represent successful and elevated meaning they were successful they were not cut off they were not harmed and they were able to succeed so here i think one of the things we will learn if we look at many places the word kalimatullah that is often you know appearing in the quran is appear i mean it it is represent the quran itself now if you look at this idea of a cause within the context of this verse what you can find is what does quran represent and therefore when we say those you know who believe their own kalima has been elevated meaning what they stand for what they represent their values have been elevated and has succeeded as against those of you know uh, the, the 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 enemies the non muslims that were trying to attack them which, which was now abased. brought down which was abased and now if you look at this interpretation or this meaning back to the hadith of you know making kalimatullah hiya al-uliya basically it's still going back to the values that this quran prophet it goes back to that that value because if you look at other verses what are those values is the value of justice so fighting injustice or oppression is part of the you know objectives of sharia and that is what uh, part of the critical things that quran represent that is the critical thing that the, the entire mission of you know the muslim umma or muslims represent and that is what takes us to what we call the fi sabilillah so i think this interpretation or this case in this verse helps us understand and you know better understand the meaning that scholars usually give that uh, these are two groups that these are representing the kalimatullah these are representing the kalima of those who disbelieve and therefore when we say the kalimatullah hiya al-uliya is this cause that these people represent has been elevated has succeeded and if that is the case the whole idea of islam is to achieve this maqasid of sharia which the quran is representing and in every occasion if you look at why we fight why we do what we do basically it's about you know ensuring that these principles these values that quran or islam represents have you know become triumph elevated has triumphed opposite. has triumphed so looking at that then the interpretation of kalimatullah hiya al-uliya still is in sync with the other verses that are talking about this particular issue on ibrahim what would you add? yeah just like he said the word al-uliya you know just means something higher or at the peak of it highest and you say ilahi kalimatullah or kalimatul islam means to advance the cause of islam so you say lita kuna kalimatullah al-uliya basically it means to advance the cause of allah because when you say whatever will make the cause of islam prevail some scholars will say kalimatullah al-uliya refers to successful outcomes that makes allah's cause and the purpose of his creation prevail So whatever you do for the advancement of Islam for the advancement of the cause of justice which Islam calls to peace maqasid sharia to be people to be united on that one god the cause of monotheism all of that is meant to mean kalimatullah uh, ibn hajar asqalani particularly said the word kalima there means kalimatullah means monotheism mm. so kalimatullah hi al uliya whatever will advance the cause of tawhid because he said allah said ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa in bainana wa bainana and kalima there means tawhid so basically it could be whatever you will do for the advancement of cause of islam politically economically socially to raise the status and the standard of living to uplift islam to promote justice to promote understanding and practice of islam whatever is ila kalimatullah and so kalimatullah hi al-uliya it's not necessarily political and even if it is political advancement it wasn't the hadith is not saying you should enforce it through fighting because sahabas didn't do that in fact the prophet did not do that let alone the sahabas who were supposed to emulate him and i think what we find you know just along the same lines when you look at the two words kalimatullah and uliya um i think imam at-tabari imam qurtubi Uh, interpret kalimatullah as allah's promise um uh, and so the context of the verse would let us know whether kalimatullah means the quran because it sometimes means that um whether it means allah's promise 
Allah's decree, um, Allah's guidance, Allah's plan, Allah's mission, um, uh, and when it comes to here, al-uliya would be above, would be supreme, would be victorious, um, would succeed. And so the verse, as you say, applies to every sector of a Muslim's life. Whenever you are doing something, fi sabilillah, it is so that Allah's plan for good triumphs, that you are playing your own effort. But it definitely does not mean going contrary to any of the objectives of the values or the methodology proposed by the Quran and Sunnah. That would be the contrary of uh, going in line with the Kalimat of God. I'd like to thank both of yeah, you. Yeah, just to add, yes, you, know, you know, in Arabic, the Khalid word al-Uliya is a superlative adjective. Mm. It's from a'ala. You know, but when you are dealing with a feminine gender, now it becomes ula. Mm. So, kalimatullahi hi al-uliya, advanced Islam should become the most victorious, advanced. That's all. So, whatever you do, just in course, in line with what you say, little kuna kalimatullahi hi al-uliya is just that Islam should become above, should mm-hmm. become superior. Because Allah juxtaposed it with wa kalimatil ladhina kafaru as-sufla, wa kalimatullahi hi al-uliya. And it's about the cost. Allah mm-hmm. And it reminds one, you know, just so that people don't get carried away with the identity of Muslim, uh, forgetting the values of Islam, uh, yeah. where Ibn Taymiyyah was saying, quoting a hadith, I think in Buhari's Adab al-Mufrad, uh, where, you know, the Prophet said, Allah will protect a community that govern themselves by justice, yeah. even if they are non-Muslims. And Allah will not protect a community that govern themselves by injustice, even if they are Muslims. We find in the hadith of the um, du'a uh, of the mazloom, the du'a of a victim of injustice. The Prophet ﷺ said there is no barrier between that du'a and Allah answering it, even if the person was a disbelieving enemy, you know, a kafir. Um, that Allah is ready to, you know, put aside the kufr of a person and ensure justice is done. He has prohibited justice from him, you know, on himself, and has prohibited us in, from, injustice. sorry, prohibited injustice for himself, and uh, definitely prohibited it for us. And so the need for Muslims to make sure that anything that we're going to do is definitely in line with what Allah has prescribed. And we don't hurt innocent people, um, do anything contrary to the will of Allah, and want to claim that that is Fisabilillah. May Allah continue to guide us all. Jazakumullah khairan for your contributions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.